In this lecture, we're going to start Chapter 7 in your textbook, Dimensional Analysis. This is probably the weirdest thing we're going to cover in the entire quarter. Um, and I'm going to explain it through example, really. So let's, let's start with, let's say you were going to design a fuel injector for a car. So you've got a small tube, and it's designed so that as you spray the fluid out of the tube, it... Um, it atomizes and forms little balls of liquid in the air and the size of those um, droplets are what determine its effectiveness or, or rather how well the fuel combusts. So we need to design this device to optimize the size of our droplets, that little d in the figure. Now if you think about this sort of device, there, there's a lot of different things that could affect that um, little d. One is the big diam the diameter of the tube itself. Probably the velocity coming out of there is going to be important. And then probably a bunch of um, fluid properties like the density, the viscosity, and the surface tension would all play a role. So let's assume that there's no um, fundamental equation to describe this phenomenon. And you have to come up with this. You have to figure this out yourself as an engineer. Um, you could arrange a bunch of experiments, but if we look at this problem now, we've got little d as a function of five different variables. And to run a set, set of experiments to, to evaluate that function, to see how the little d varies in five different variables would be an absolute nightmare. It would take forever and would be tons of experiments. This is where dimensional analysis comes in. Dimensional analysis is a method to combine variables into fundamental dimensionless numbers, like the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number, which we've used and is very useful, comes out of this process. And it's a combination of, um, of several variables, right? Velocity, diameter, and viscosity and density. So it combines those four variables into a single variable a single dimensionless number which has um, very important meaning in fluids. So when we work with these dimensionless numbers it simplifies our functions and also simplifies the experiments we need to run to to figure out the processes involved. Okay so in this chapter we're going to learn how to come up with our own dimensionless numbers like the Reynolds number. The first thing we are going to use is the Buckingham Pi theorem. And this is a methodical way to derive meaningful dimensionless numbers. And we're going to use capital letter pi to describe to, for um, dimensionless numbers. And with Buckingham pi theorem, it, we can determine how many pi's we need to, to generate. And here's what it is. k variables can be reduced to k minus r pi's where r is the minimum number of reference dimensions needed to describe the variables. So what that means, this minimum number of reference dimensions, that means um, different reference dimensions are like length, time, and mass. And sometimes temperature is used. But um, so how many dimensions are used in the problem? So for the problem, the example I just showed, we've got little d as a function of five different variables. And we can look up the reference dimensions for these. Obviously, for little d and big D, it's just length. For velocity, it's length per time. For density, it's mass per volume, so it's mass per length cubed. And then viscosity and um, surface tension, you can look up. Um, notice the notation here, the equal sign with a little dot over it that signifies has the units of. So it's not equals, it's just has those units. Um, we've just defined the variables in this problem using the MLT system, meaning mass, length, time. You could also use the FLT system. So for surface tension, for example, it makes more sense to define it in terms of force per unit length. That's at least how we normally talk about it. Um, so you can use the FLT system or the MLT system, but you just have to make sure you don't 
mix them and use both. So you can't have force and mass in your problem when you're when you're doing dimensional analysis. Okay, so let's get back to the Buckingham pi theorem. It said the number of pi's is k minus r, where k is the number of variables. So in this case we have six variables. And r is the number of reference dimensions. We have length, we have time, and we have mass. So our r is 3. So according to Buckingham pi, we need 6 minus 3, or 3 pi's, to define this problem. So we can convert this problem, little d is a function of five variables, to a function, to pi 1 is a function of just two variables. So we can greatly reduce the complexity of this problem using dimensional analysis. Okay, now to develop these pies, we're going to use a met the method of repeating variables. And it's about seven steps, and we'll go through it right now. The first step is to list all the variables, and they must be independent. That is, you can't express one in terms of another. So this independence, it's a mathematical construct, and we'll, we'll use it again in a moment. So just for example, we picked these variables to define this system, and that's fine. These will normally be given to you in the problem, by the way. What if, on the other hand, I decided to pick these variables? I used gamma instead of rho, and I used nu instead of mu. That's actually fine, because they, they represent the same physical phenomenon. They're, they just have slightly different meanings and slightly different units. So either one of that set of um, variables would be OK to proceed with the dimensional analysis. But here's where you can get into trouble. What if I use this set? So I use rho, mu, and nu as um, in my in my um, variable list. Those are those three are not independent. They're actually dependent on one one another. So this is incorrect because I can write rho or I can write nu as a function of mu and rho, just like that. So that's the definition for independence, or dependence rather, and if, if variables are dependent, you can't use them. Okay, second step is express each variable in its basic dimensions. We've already done that. Third step is determine the required number of pi terms. We've already looked at that. That uses the Buckingham pi theorem. In this case, it's 6 minus 3, length, mass, and time. That gives us 3 pi's. Um, now we have to select our repeating variables, and there are r number of them. So the number of reference dimensions that tells you how many repeating variables you need. And there's three rules. You can't include the dependent variable. All the reference dimensions must be represented in the repeating variables. So in that set of three variables, you've got to have length, mass, and time at least once. And then each must be dimensionally independent. And here's that independence again. It's a mathematical term. And we can test it the same sort of way. Um, if they are dependent, then they can com be, be combined to form one of the other ones. Or if they are dependent, you can form a dimensionless number with your repeating variables. So if either of those two things are true, then you cannot use those as your set of repeating variables. So for the example problem that I'm doing right now, we have six variables. We need to pick three of them as repeating variables. Um, how about I pick this set? Big D, mu, and V. Okay, it satisfies A. I haven't used little d. It satisfies B. I have all the reference dimensions. There's an L in there, there's an M in there, and there's a T in there, so I'm fine. Now, are they dimensionally independent? If I look at the, the um, units in those three variables, and I start dividing them and multiplying them by each other, I don't see any way, for example, I can cancel out the M, because no other term has an M. So those are dimensionally independent. I can't combine them to form another one, and I can't form a dimensionless number with them. So that would be a fine set. What if I pick this as my set? 
So this is a different, these are three different variables that are also potential to, that can also potentially be used. Um, satisfies A, little d is not there. I got a length, I got a mass, I got a time in there, so it satisfies B. And C, they, these are all, this set is also dimensionally independent. If you play around with that, I don't think there's any way you can get those units to cancel out. I can get the M's to cancel out, but the, but there's no way I can get the T to cancel out. So this is fine. Now, now look at this. This is kind of strange. You can proceed with either one of these sets of variables as repeating variables. And once you do that, you may get a different answer depending what set of repeating variables you select. And there's nothing wrong with that. So keep in mind with these problems that there's more than one right answer. Which is one of the reasons I didn't give you answers for this in the homework is because there's more than one right answer and I don't want you just trying to mimic what the book does because there's a second or a third or maybe even a fourth right answer to some of these problems. Let's look at this other set. If I picked little d, sigma, and rho. Well, we know right off the bat you can't use little d because it's the dependent variable. So that fails A. I think it's okay with B and C. We got an L, a T, and an M. And I don't and those are those are dimensionally independent. Let's look at this set. Sigma, mu, and v. I didn't use D, so it satisfies A. I got an M, a T, and an L, so it satisfies B. But if you play around with these, I think these are dimensionally dependent. If I Let's see, how does this work? If I take mu and divide my sigma, I think I get v. I get 1 over v. So if I get sigma and divide by mu, then I get the same variable as v. So then if I divide by v, I can cancel that entirely and form a dimensionless number. So this fails test C because these three variables are dimensionally are dimensionally dependent. Now make sure you take a good look at that because you, you want to make sure when you pick your repeating variables you don't pick a set that are dependent and it's it's kind of tricky so spend some time looking at those variables to make sure you understand what we're talking about. Here's another set this will be the last one and this set fails everything so little d is used so we can't use it. Notice little d and big D are also dimensionally dependent because L over L cancels out. And notice that there's no M in this set. I, I didn't pick a variable that has M in it so this fails all three. Okay, once you've picked your repeating variables then you can go ahead and form your pi terms. There's two ways to do this. I'm going to show one way in this lecture and the next one we'll look at another way. The way I like to do it is you multiply your non-repeating variables by the repeating variables to get dimensionless numbers. And that's as simple as that. You can raise them to any power, but the non-repeating variable must be raised to the power of 1. So, let's go back to our example problem. I have selected these three variables as my repeating variables. Then the three remaining variables in the problem, they are my non-repeating variables. So for pi 1, I'm going to start with that first non-repeating variable. Now, I need to take my repeating variables and somehow multiply them or divide them by that d, by that little d, to get rid of the units to form a dimensionless number. So can you see a way of using big D, mu, or v to cancel out the units in little d. And this one's pretty straightforward. All I got to do is divide by big D. I get L over L. They cancel out. I have just formed a dimensionless number. Pi 1 in this problem now is little d over big D. And you'll often see these kind of scale relationships of different size things pop out of your dimensional analysis. OK, let's go on to pi 2. Uh, pi 2 is rho. I've got L, L to the minus 3. Now I need to use my repeating variables to make this dimensionless. 
This one's a little more complicated, and I want to show you a, a logical way to proceed. Um, so I want to cancel out the M, and I want to cancel out the L. If I look at my repeating variables, all three of them have got an L in it. So I really, I, I have no idea what L, which variable to use to get rid of the L. But only one of them has an M in it. So it's pretty clear by looking at this, the only way I'm going to get rid of that M is to divide by mu. So let's go ahead and do that and start there. So I divide by mu. The m's cancel out. Now I've got lengths and time in there. If I go back to my repeating variables, I've used mu, so I'm not going to use that again. Um, I can now use d or v. Both of them have l's in it, so I don't know which one to use for the l's. So let's still ignore the l's. But it's pretty clear that there's only one way that I can get that t to cancel out. And it's in this case, it's to multiply by v. So let's do that. And that gets rid of the t's. Now in my final step here, all I've got are l's. And I can use the d to cancel out the l's. And it turns out, the math gets a little ugly here, but if I multiply by d, I get all those l's to cancel out. And there is pi 2. So make sure you go through that procedure. You make sure you understand that logical procedure. We'll do one more. But I want to pause here for a moment. That should that pi should look familiar to you, right? That is the Reynolds number. And I want you to know that I didn't this isn't a setup. I didn't pick a problem specifically so the Reynolds number would appear. Turns out the Reynolds number pops up in all kinds of problems when you do this. And think about what we did here we didn't use anything about the fluid itself. We just took a problem, we found all the variables, and then we basically just played around with the dimensions. So without knowing anything about fluid behavior, we were, we were able to derive the Reynolds number, which is a really important parameter for fluid mechanics. I think this, this process is kind of magical. It just, these these important things just kind of pop out of the mathematics. Okay, our last dimensionless number starts with um, sigma. And again, so I've got m t to the minus 1, or t to the minus 2 rather. Now I've got, in my repeating variables, I've got two variables that have t's in it, so I don't know which one of those to choose. But I've only got one with an m. So it's pretty clear I'm going to have to divide by mu. The m's cancel. Now I've got length and time. Again, d and v both have length, so I don't know which one to use. But only one of them's got time. So it's pretty clear I have to multiply by v, or rather, sorry, divide by v to get the t's to cancel out. And it just so happens that the L's cancel out as well in this case, and that gives us our final pi. So we've taken a problem with six variables and reduced it to a form with really only three variables. So if I were going to run those experiments to design a fuel injector, I've greatly reduced the number of experiments I need to run.